Welcome to episode 497 of Get Paid for Your Pad. We are your hosts, Jesper Rivers and Mr. Eric Muller. And today we are talking about how to renovate your Airbnb, how to create a budget, how to figure out why what you want to renovate and how I, how uh, to actually go make a plan and, and go through the whole process. Um, and which is why, uh, which is what we are planning to do with Free Wild in the upcoming months. So let's, uh, let's dive into it. Uh, Eric, a question for you. Why why do we even want to renovate? Well, Jasper, I know you haven't been in our actual units, but the outside of our our units uh, are nice, but the inside are pretty terrible. Uh, the experience is just not there. <laughs> um, no, I mean, what you're, you know, first off, I love this stuff, man. Like this is my background is uh, renovation and development and, you know, all of that. Um, and this is one of the things that really I love about short-term rentals, especially on the investment side is my background was like fix it, buying old houses, fixing them up and flipping them. Right. Um, and we would do like the absolute bare minimum to these properties to get it sold. And they would look nice and all that, but there was no real experience there. It was like bare walls, no furniture, nothing like that. Right. What I love about, what we're doing in short-term rentals is the ability to create experiences through our investments. Right. Uh, so it's a lot of fun, man. Like I, you know, I'll get into a little bit of what I'm doing, uh, through the process, but you know, to answer your question, why we want to do it at the end of the day, it's to drive more bookings at higher revenue, like higher rates. Right. That's what that means. At the end of the day, we're creating experiences to connect with our guest avatar that we've created for this company. Uh, also the properties have to match our brand, right? Like if, uh, I don't know if you trying to think of an example here, if you, if you go to like a McDonald's, but you feel like you're walking into like a five-star experience or like a dungy, you know, like burger joint or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like their brand is completely off there. It's not matching the brand. There's certain expectations, right? So we're going to be doing that, all of that stuff with our current property. And then that's also going to support us for our brand of expanding uh free wild, right? Like this, this other hotel that we're looking at, if we do buy that, it's going to, it's going to go with the theme of what we're creating with the brand of, uh, uh of free wild. So I'm excited about it, man. Luckily, the properties that we have are not huge uh, renovations. Um, most of the renovations that we're going to be doing is going to be going into the experience side, right? Of the aesthetics of the property, the the paint, the art, all that stuff um, in phase one. Phase two is the development, which we could talk about as well. So, yeah. But you recently dove into the numbers, right? Which, which I know as a numbers guy, that's uh, probably a lot of fun for you. Yeah. Yeah. I got some pretty good insight. Um, and basically what I was trying to do, like you asked me the question, you know, how much money can we spend on these units to really get to like top performing properties in our market? Right. Because before you start renovating, you want to, you want to understand like, you know, how much extra revenue can you generate? Is it worth the investment? Right. How much exactly. can, I do I, can I spend? Yeah. Um, cause you could spend like five or we could spend half a million, on one of these units and turn it into something amazing. But then it turns out that people don't want to pay the ADR that's needed to actually get an ROI on sure. the investment, right? Yeah. And, and, so- and let me, let me touch on that real quick to give some background too. Like when you're buying investments like this, this is, you know, essentially like a hotel, of you know, buying these four units, all the land to develop out another 10 plus units, the whole thing. Um, going into these, we have to just put together a ballpark of what we think we can renovate these properties at, right? And what we can develop it at. Now we have a rough budget of what we bought the property for that now boots on the ground. I have to go and figure out exactly what we can put into the um, due diligence, what I could put into or what we can put into for the renovation, for the furniture, for the art, for the, you know, the whole thing. Right. So there's so many different small phases and these things get eaten up really quick. Um, you know, like for example, uh, the, um, interior designers that we're dealing with that we want to help us develop the brand of free wild here, you know, their prices are near nearly a hundred thousand we we've gotten quotes for a hundred thousand to three hundred thousand dollars just for design uh elements, right? Like just for the design um effort 
put into it. I'm like, holy crap. Okay, well, we got to really narrow it down. What is the total budget? But then how do we allocate that budget to all the moving parts of these types of renovations? So mm-hmm. just want to give some background on that. What what did you discover? Like, what did you come up come up with? Yeah, so I uh, I dug into AirDNA and <clears throat> again, my uh, my my goal with that was uh, to just understand like what what does a, a, a top five performing studio do? In, in Idlewild. What does a two bedroom do? What does a three bedroom do? Because all our units are different sizes. We have a studio, we have a two bedroom, and then I guess we have two two bedrooms, but schoolhouse and the mill house with the mill schoolhouse is a lot smaller though. And then we have a, a four bedroom with the barn. Right. So we have we have these uh these these four different units. So the first thing is I want to understand like what what could these units you know potentially make if we were top of our market. First thing I found out, one of our units is actually the top of our market, pretty much. Boom! <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah, our, our Daydreamers Den is actually uh, the number four. And you can, by the way, if you if you were listening to this and you want to you wanna start doing this, if you're interested in renovating, you want to understand exactly like, you know, what are the top performing properties in your market, you get a subscription on AirDNA. Uh, you can literally see the top nine performing properties in your market. So then you can, you can start comparing, right? Cause these properties are all different um, for the, for the den, which is our studio. I looked at all the studios in Idlewild and there's, you know, there's units like ours, but there's also really unique type of structures like yurts and mm-hmm. tree houses. And, you know, those are, th- th- those are really they, those are performing really, really well, but our, sure. our den is, um, is projecting, we haven't had it for a year. So I had to ex- extrapolate the revenue, but it's, uh, it's looking to do almost 50 K and there's not, there's not, there's hardly any studios that do more than that. There's nice. one yurt that does a little bit more, but literally the top performing is like 56. Um, so we're, we're very close to, to the top level, which makes me wonder like, okay, well, do we even need to renovate that one? a lot then if it's performing so well right dude that's a great question man that's a great question do we actually need to renovate it and it's like at the end of, well i mean i guess at the end of the day that's going to come down to you it's going to come down to two things in my mind one does the unit match the brand and how important is that to us to develop a brand or just run a short term rental there um and then number two is how is that going to truly impact the unit ADR and total revenue? Because if we're generating that now with its current state, which it's not bad, it's a nice unit. That's my favorite one. Like when I go up there with Samantha, like that's the one that we stay at because we absolutely love it and everyone loves it, right? Um, and it also matches the avatar that we're going after. Young couples mm-hmm. tr- leaving LA and San Diego that want to want to go hiking, right? So we know that we're going to build more studios and one bedrooms that match that versus these big four bedrooms and two bedrooms. It's like, they're just not booking as, as well. Um, so that's what that comes down to. And if I had to answer that, if you said, Eric, you know, we have to make a decision right now, I would say to the first question, to me, it is extremely important that we build our units match the brand of our property or of our company. Right. Because to me, the bigger zooming out 30 years from now, 10 years from now, the most valuable part, is, the most valuable thing that we're going to be working on is the brand of Free Wild, right? So the experiences have to match the brand, right? Um, so I would say, yes, 100%, we got to renovate, but then that, you know, we don't have to go crazy with the design and everything else. It just has to, the experience, the feels every, and we'll go into that because on one of our team calls right before this, I, I got some Etsy develop, uh, deliveries here and breaking out different pieces. So I can go into like how I'm structuring all that. Then on the second question, I would ask you, of how will this actually impact our revenue on an annual basis by increasing the experience and making it more of a desirable unit? Because we can't add more square footage. We're not going to add more features. It's going to be the experience. It already has a hot tub, maybe some privacy, stuff like that. It's going to be the experience that's booking out. So mm-hmm. I would toss that question back at you of like, how would that actually impact us if we did? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, well, first of all, um, I see the value in, in, in the brand building, right? So we definitely want to have free weld mugs in the units and we want to have the color, our brand colors and all that stuff, right? The question that I'm asking myself is if we, let's say we put like 10, 20K into this unit and, and really upgrade it, right? Is it possible for us to go above to break through that barrier that seems to be there in our market around the, the 50 K for, for studios, right. Are we able to actually push through that and, you know, just become the top one, uh, studio unit in Adwald with a, by a distance, right. Or is that, is that kind of like the top of what people are willing to pay for a studio? That's a great question, man. That's a great question. Um, I, you know, I, I was talking to Andrew uh, McConnell from Rented, and I was picking his brain about this. I'm like, hey, this is free wild. This is what we're doing in Idlewild and looking at additional markets. And we want to build out these cool uh, tiny homes, cabins, the whole thing. He's like, listen, it's this is one of the toughest questions on a revenue management side to respond to because we're creating the market, right? We're creating something unique in that space, just like the yurt. Right. Like that. I know exactly what you're talking about. Like the, the couple that runs that you're awesome couple from Ottawa I've met them a few times. They have two units. They have one yurt and then like a front house, I believe. Um, you can't really predict what you're going to do with that thing. Right. Cause you're creating the market with that unit. Um, so for me, I'm at the end of the day, it's like, okay, well, what is our, it is, if we don't raise the ADR, but we raise occupancy and demand for it, which will of course increase the ADR, but if we can consistently book that property and that becomes a desirable unit, then yeah, we can start shaping what the market's like for that one unit. But for me, I don't think we're going to do that with its current state. I think mm -hmm. we got to invest in the experience of that property to, to justify those increases. Um, Plus, you know, it's, it's one of the fastest units that we can renovate because we're not knocking mm -hmm. down walls or doing anything. We're just cleaning it up and yep. creating an experience in there. So that's a good question. I think it would be more on the demand than it would be on the, uh, the ADR side. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's interesting because, um, because when you look at those top performing properties, they're, they're doing very similar, the occupancy is pretty much the same as uh as ours you know and the adr is also pretty much the same it's a little a little bit higher right but not much so yeah i guess we we don't really have an answer to that but uh but i was just excited first of all i was excited to see that uh our units was you know was performing so well but it it, it taught me some other things too you know because i looked at uh one bedrooms i looked at two bedrooms i looked at three and four bedrooms i guess four and more and it's really interesting because I was thinking, okay, if a studio, you know, top performing studio does about 50K, then, you know, a four or five bedroom is probably going to do like triple that, you know, or maybe, but it, that's not really the case. Um, the larger homes are, are just not really performing that well. The, the two bedrooms, the really nice two bedrooms, the A-frames, they do around like 100, 125 but the three bedrooms and the four bedrooms, they don't really do much more than that. Unless hmm. it's like a super unique, amazing luxury overlooking views and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it looks it looks like uh looks like that the, that studio and the and that one bedroom that we have in mind uh, for this market is really the best uh the best investment, the best ROI. Yeah. 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 It's interesting, man. Um, yeah. Those bigger properties are really, you know, that's the draw, right? That's the experiences like the nature and, and the views, which, you know, we don't necessarily have that with our bigger property, our four unit, as far as the views, we have access to the, mar to the area uh, and access to that, that, the park that we have. So, you know, we got to decide how much we can put into that unit based on the demand there. But what we have, which is different from everybody else, well, from most other hosts, I should say, in that area is not only do we have just one four bedroom, but we have the ability to rent out the entire community and the four bedroom being the central hub for, you know, for the party and the events and the family and whatever it is, the gathering spot, right? So which we get a lot of requests for that, right? So for the four bedroom, it's like, 
knowing that, that that might be the best way to optimize that property is to include it in a full village rental. It's like, okay, well now going into the renovations, what do those guests need? They need an open layout. They need big space to cook and eat and gather, right? They, um, but we still need as many bedrooms as possible. So we don't want to tear out too many bedrooms. We have to add an additional bedroom upstairs, right? And like really going through that space, but then also knowing like this is going to be the space where maybe a lot of photos are being taken, take in the whole thing. So the, the experience needs to be next level uh, on the interior design and exterior design as well. So that's, this is the funny thing about real estate development is like when, especially when it comes to hospitality, it's, we have to look at what, what does, what's going to create that experience. For example, we're, um, I'm, I've built a relationship with two designers, this design creative agency out of LA that, uh, I absolutely love, man. Like they, they've designed and built two of my favorite restaurants here in San Diego places are just like two of the most incredible experiences it's called campfire and Jean and Jule. And they're building a couple other restaurants. They design these big hotels, hundred plus units, the whole thing. And they're designing these massive properties all around the world. Um, and they're just interior designers on the side. They're not the actual builders. So I've reached out and over the last couple of months, built relationships with them and trying to convince them to work with us on Wild and Free Wild to create the designs. But I'm getting inside, finally getting inside the, the mindset of these ho big hospitality companies and what they invest into the experience of their hotels. This company designed a brand new hotel that just opened up in Oceanside. And they uh, also designed a restaurant that was in that hotel. So Samantha and I went up there, had had dinner there to try to, you know, like just take in the whole experience. He's like, Eric, you've got to see this property. They went above and beyond on the experience and also in areas where we felt that they didn't need to go. But the moment we walked into that hotel, man, like from the second we we're there, Samantha's like, oh, we got to stay here. We got to stay here. I'm like, what are you talking about? We live down the block. Like, we don't have to stay at this hotel. She's like, no, this is amazing. Look at this detail. And we're walking around for a good 45 minutes, just picking up all the small details of the design in that in the property. And I wasn't expecting that in the hotel. The reason why I sh share this story is I recognize the importance of that when you're building a brand around hospitality is going above and beyond and being obsessed with the details of your property. You're mm -hmm. not just your customer service and the experience that they're having when they're interacting with the people in your team, but when they're sitting on the couch in your unit and they look over and they're like, you know, they see something that's intentional to be there and it just kind of shifts their perspective. It's completely different than just a regular place with a bed and a couch and the whole thing. It's like, those are comfortable spaces, but we're trying to create something that's memorable to want you to go back and stay there again. And all the elements that go into that, especially for creative people, like that becomes so much fun because there's so many different small elements to cultivate that experience. So for me, I want to go, create like i wish i had an unlimited budget so i can go in here and be you know an artist and create this whole thing but then we also need to make a profit at the end of the day right so yeah. we can do more of these and create jobs and do the whole thing so that's the delicate balance of like creating the experience but not being a not allowing the artist to go free on an unlimited budget right because yeah. we have to yeah. make a profit at the end of the day which brings me to the next point. The next question that I was asking myself, uh, looking at these units and, um, you know, we talked about the den. We have four units. One's the den, one's the mill house, one's the schoolhouse, and one is the barn. The mill house is also performing pretty well. Um, but I think we can, uh, compare to the top properties, um, we can probably, uh, increase our revenue about by about 25, 30 K a year. If we Damn. invest into that. Damn. Right to get, and again, I'm Let's looking go. at uh, looking at the top performing properties, and then I'm comparing our revenue with with the top performing properties. Now, some of them, I, I some of them are as different. You know, like I said, like if you have a if you have a, a home that's on top of the mountain with an amazing view, sure, this is something it's that we, we can create. That exactly. No. So, I looked at I looked at the the properties that are kind of like you know in the same zone, kind of like close to downtown. Um, there's a couple A-frames out there that are very popular, the A-frames. 
So mm-hmm. that's interesting to see as well. But I think the Millhouse could do an extra 25k. But then the question is, if if we can get 25k extra revenue per year, like mm-hmm. how much how much do we want to invest in? What's because depending on how much we invest into it, that will determine our ROI. So I was thinking, you know, I was thinking times three. So investing a maximum of three times the additional annual revenue that we think we can make. So that would mean that we would make our money back in three years. What What are your thoughts on that? Ah, uh, man, that excites me, bro. Give me that budget. Go get me that budget. I mean, that's that's quite a bit of money, man. Like, I understand why you're saying that, right? I understand why you're saying that because like we look at... um. Uh, what book was I? Oh, I was reading uh, Scaling Up today and they talk about like how corporate companies look at their employees and their team members and say, okay, for every dollar I invest into this person where the company should receive X out at the end. Right. And it, it's like the same, same thing with, with ads, right? Every dollar I put in, I, I should get $3 out. Right. And we look at it that way. Um, the money to invest 75000 into that one unit. I don't think it's needed. I really don't. I think we could do what I was thinking was like, how do we, how do we get our money back within a year? Right. Mm -hmm. So, but there's, I I think this is really just a gut feeling on where we're going. Cause like when we were in Mexico, one of the legends, and we're not going to mention the company here, but one of the huge VC backed arbitrage companies that went under one of our legends was informing us on the amount of money that they were investing in their units, right. To create the experience. And they had, you know, I've stayed at some of their units, their units were amazing, but that was a big reason why they went under because they couldn't justify the inv- They couldn't get their investment back out. Right now. I know this is different. We have forced appreciation. We have tax advantages. We have the whole thing of owning the property, uh, which is great. Um, but to understand like, where's that money, how do you determine that budget? Uh, and what are we comfortable with? Right. So like also the cost of the money over time and like the economy, can we, will it take three years? Or will it take five? And how would that actually impact cash flow? Right. Over time. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I mean, that excites me because that tells me I got a big budget to, to play with up there mm-hmm. and, and create these incredible experiences. Um, Cause I'm so used to like back in the day when I was flipping houses, like, how do you, how do you create an awesome property with the smallest budget possible? Right. Mm-hmm. But this is also just like how, you know, what I'm learning with, with restaurants and the amount of money that they invest into the, their experience to create amazing experiences top tier restaurants. Um, it's because they have the cash flow coming in consistently on their business. So they can justify that over a period of time. But yeah, I don't know. I don't think we need personally, I think I could do a better job with half that budget. I, I could do a great job with half that budget in that property. Um, but that's also I like that mindset, understanding your mindset of like, hey, actually let's three X this, or, you know, can we, are we comfortable making this investment back over three years? But then also, how does that play in with the cost and the investment of the actual property and making the, making the, you know, the, the cost of acquiring that property and the money and all of that come into play? Are you factoring that into your three years as well? Yeah. I mean, that's a different, that's a different calculation to make. Right. And like, if you buy one unit, let's say you buy a house for like $200,000, right. And then you're making, Let's say you're making, um, you know, 40,000 revenue on the Airbnb, right? Then it's a very easy calculation of saying like, hey, if I if I invest an additional 20,000, right? 10% of the purchase price. And if I, if that raises my revenue to like 50,000, then that's worth, that's worth my money, right? Because it's better to make 50 on, two, on 220 than to make 40 on 200. But since we bought four units plus a lot of land, right? We also we have a lot of land that we're going to be building new units on. So that makes the, the calculation a little bit trickier. Um, but what I will say is if we just look at our total ROI, right. On like, we just take the rev- total revenue of our properties and we calculate based on the amount of money that we bought it for. What's the ROI on that total thing. Yeah. If we look at one of the units, as long as our ROI on that on that on that renovation is higher than the ROI on our total property, then that's then that's good. Mm. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it does. It does. I think but we also have to look at the factor of the refinance, right? Cuz like at the end of the day, 
when we go to, when we build all this out and we have, you know, and, and this could be a whole nother po podcast about the approval process up there and what we're learning through this period, we're going to have at a bare minimum three additional units upwards of 15 additional units, which is huge and the unknown. And that's another decision that we're trying to make on the depth that we want to go into the approval process with. But at the end of the day, in two years from now, when we refinance this, bring this to a, a local bank, they're going to looking at, they're going to look at the performance of the entire pro property, right? Not individual units. Right. So they're just the same way that we're looking at this hotel uh, down the road from, from, from this property. Like we're looking at how is the in total property producing, even though there's more certain units that produce better than the others, we have to look at the entire asset. Right. Mm -hmm. So I understand what you're saying as well. Um, as long as, as long as we're getting that ROI and we're getting that cap rate where we need to be for an attractive renovate, uh, refi so we can pay back the investors and still cash flow, And, you know, obviously take some cash out of this as well. And hopefully in a couple of years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but I think, um, you know, I think the budget that I calculated based on the, like the rule that I created, and I didn't do much research into this, so I don't know if it's, <laughs> you know, if that's common yeah. to say like, oh, we want to make our money back in in three years with renovations. But I'd see like, I would say that's like an upper limit of the budget, right? Like, it doesn't mean that we have to use all that money. Obviously, if we can, if we can figure out a way to get our property to be at that top performing level with a smaller investment, then that's preferable. Yeah. Yeah. And for anyone who's listening to this, by the way, that, you know, your, your experience in this space, as far as like developing hotels and cabin communities and like multiple units in one, one property, uh, reach out to us, let us know how you're analyzing these deals and what you look at. One thing I recognize though, man, is like, you know, everyone has a different perspective of what they're, how they analyze deals and what they're comfortable with at the end of the day. Right. So like the, the, the other hotel that we're looking at uh, currently, you know, still running numbers on, I brought that to three real estate investor friend of mine that do some huge numbers in real estate. All three of them had the same information and questions that they asked, but all different um, comfortability on what they would take on. If that makes sense. Like they, you know, one person was very conservative and like, Hey, I want to touch this thing unless we got double digits and, you know, the cap rate and, you know, CapEx was blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, I was like, Oh, that would never freaking work, you know? And then we have somebody else here, you know, uh, my other friend who understands brand and what we're trying to do on the hospitality side. He's like, Hey, if you can add this to your portfolio, even though it's not hitting the, the exact returns that we desire, it's still cash flowing and still profitable, but look what it does to the brand as a whole, right? Can we still refinance this? Can we get 50% financing from a local bank? Can we raise the other 50% through private financing? And through that, can we hit the numbers to, you know, have a, a, an attractive cash flow on this, but not look for a home run because it's going to impact the brand as a whole. Mm -hmm. So it's like everyone at the end of the day, you got to really just decide what is your strategy and what are you comfortable with? And to me that like a company like this, it's leading towards what's the bigger vision of our, our, our brand, right. Or of our company. And, you know, it's kind of what we did in that workshop, right. What is your business model? And for us, it's a, it's a legacy company. So that means this thing, just like Marriott, right? Like Marriott's a legacy company. Um, that means we can be patient with the properties we take on. That also means that, you know, we don't need home runs every single time because we're not 100% mm -hmm. relying on each property to be perfect, right? We're building a brand, which eventually will be as valuable um, as the real estate that we own. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, that makes a little sense. I mean, I've stated a lot of Marriott, Marriott's and four seasons and Sheraton's and stuff. And it's, it's not always like a super unique property that you're staying at. Right. I'm just staying there because I know what to expect. Exactly. Um, cool. Well, why don't you, uh, why don't you go into a little bit of, um, of some, I know you have a lot of experience with like renovating units and walk us through the process, right? At first there's the budgeting. Well, what are the next steps? Yeah. Well, I mean, first is understanding like what, so, so to kind of give some background, like Idlewild is it's what's called an uh, unincorporated 
area, right? Unincorporated town. That means that there is no local um, government. It's all governed by the county of Riverside, right? Which is unique. This is why, you know, the, the mayor of, you know, the town is a dog who unfortunately passed away a couple of weeks ago, but mayor max. Right. And like, that's a big thing for Ottawa is like, he drives around town and everyone takes photos with the mayor who's a golden retriever. Right. It's because there's no law making decision makers of the town. It's all on the County side. Right. So you have to like, for us, the, the trickiest part is to understand what can we do legally on this property that will be the 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 um easiest path the path of least resistance to get to what we want because we can go and and go to the county and build all like our property are approved for a lot of density meaning we can add a lot of structures and units to our properties but that's not what we want to build. We want to build something unique, which is cabins and tiny homes. Okay. Well, even though we have the, the approval, the zoning for density, now we're looking at building something unique that they are not that familiar with. So we have to go through a whole nother process, right. Um, of approval. So the biggest thing for us right away is just understanding what can we build and what are we comfortable building? Cause it could take two, three, I mean, we're in California, which is the worst state in the country to do any type of business first off, but especially being a real estate developer in the state is one of the most difficult things you can do in California is try to get approvals to build housing for whatever reason. Um, it, 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 it could take us three, four years to build the dream of free wild there on our property. Knowing that we got to work backwards and say, okay, well, that's not good for our business. We have to build something fast. So what can we get approvals for? So we went from, I, I went from like looking at this property and saying, okay, we're going to renovate and build all these things at the same time and just shut down the village for like six months and get it done to, okay, now we have three specific phases, right? Phase one is renovating the existing four units and the, the surrounding land. Phase two is building on the second lot on North circle of three to four tiny homes right there. Cause those are easy to, to easier to get approvals for. And then phase three is building and getting approvals for the lower park on the river. Now we're running into issues there because it sits down off the road. So we have to add emergency access, big, you know, um, uh, driveway. So, emergency, you know, like fire trucks and get down there turn around and come back out. But if we do that, then it's going to cut all the trees down. And like, we got so many different things that we have to get approvals for. So, so the process now is like, we're doing the unsexy stuff of trying to find engineers and architects to go to the County with ideas of like, Hey, this is what we want to do. What would you be comfortable with? What can we get approved? What, what do we have to fight? You know, the whole thing. And we, of course, want to build something that the county is proud of and the community is proud of and, you know, excited about. But you also want to build something that's going to be, you know, profitable for us at the end of the day, too. So so that's the phase that we're going through now. It's all discovery. It's trying to find our team, our team, which is very difficult in smaller markets to go and get these approvals. Right. But then we're doing what you know the sexy part of this on the phase one renovations which is developing renovating our existing units and the land around it as well which is a lot of fun man like this stuff is like for me i freaking love it because this is we're renovating existing units and what what we're trying to do is understand we understand our avatar right? Like we, we developed an avatar and then we have to ask ourselves, what does our avatar want in these properties? Right? What are they desiring? What, what are they seeking to, you know, to create an experience that is better than all the other short-term rental units in Ottawa wild. Right? So to build this, we're building a brand of looking at, okay, what are the colors, everything from the colors and the materials all the way down to the smells, the scents, of the property, what are they seeing? What are they feeling? What are they hearing? What are they smelling? Right? What are they tasting? Like we're cultivating the entire experience, right? The tricky part with that is you can spend a lot of freaking money 
on things that you know could be overlooked right for for everyone who's watching the uh the youtube side like this is an example of a scent that i'm testing for out of wild because what i'm trying to do is create a scent of free wild so um there was a there was a store in the mall back in like the early 2000s where they used to pump out cologne or a certain smell outside their like in their store so every single time you walk past it it hits you and you you're triggered to like go into the store it remind you mm-hmm. same thing with um subway you know the famous smell of subway mm-hmm. you know, like the sandwiches the breads and all that stuff most of that is the actual scent that they're pumping out into their store oh, wow. right and they're doing that to to attract them and to attract that person in and solidify an experience for them right so i'm trying to do the same thing but my point is like this one little thing is like twenty dollars and i'm trying to justify like is this worth putting in our units every single time to create this scent and if not how do we how do we do that so this is the part and i can go deep into this man but this is the part that i love is is like just like how you love numbers it's a puzzle for you to put the numbers together i love creating these experiences because i'm pulling all these small little elements in to cultivate a full-on experience of the unit from what are they seeing once they walk into the door where they feeling right so like what is that mm-hmm. feeling that is created through the temperature through the the furniture the way the furniture is laid out the lighting the whole thing uh what are they smelling so how do we cultivate a free wild scent in there so they they're like hey i have to have this candle and like they when they smell it they think of free wild right um all the way down to cultivating the playlist we have a we have a free wild playlist that's going to be on repeat playing at the units right that they can download and listen to when they're in the car so that whole, all these small elements. So on the whole other side of our office here, I'm starting to receive, I told you that I'm like obsessed with Etsy right now mm-hmm. because you can find all these cool elements on Etsy that are custom outside of like Target and all this stuff. So this other side of my, the office is we have all these small elements that we're starting to put together and put together like what's called a vibe uh, uh, or a lookbook of materials and colors. And then from there, we take it to a designer, interior designer who will help us cultivate the entire design of the unit. So yeah, man, you got to like for this element, you got to be obsessed with the details. It's just like the numbers. You have to be obsessed with the numbers when you're investing in a property, when it comes to the experience and the design, you have to be obsessed with the details of how to create an experience for your guests. It feel you know it's it, it goes pretty deep into that. You know, it, it's funny you mentioned the smell, and I was I was just trying to look it up uh, <clears> online because <throat> I I forgot the name of the hotel, but there there was this hotel that I used to stay at whenever I would travel to Asia. It's kind of like mm-hmm. a Marriott. But I I'm blanking on the name. I'm blanking on the name now. But one of the reasons that I always go back there is because they had a very specific smell in the lobby. And yep. every time I walk into that hotel and I'd smell, I'd smell it, I would just, I don't know. It just makes you feel at home or something. Exactly. You recognize yeah. it. Dude, like you walk into any, any quality hotel, that's what they're creating there. They're creating, uh, they're creating the experience and touching on all the senses. Right. And it goes all the way to the comf- comfortability of the bed and the sheets. And there's a reason why, you know, every hotel puts down uh, white sheets, right? It gives the, the, the belief, the immediate belief that these are clean and luxury. Any other color get, can cause a different type of reaction to somebody. It's crazy. Like it's all psychology at the end of the day uh, on this, but you you get to cultivate something that's unique to yourself. But this is why I was saying, like, we have to also be obsessed with the numbers because I need you to tell me, like, hey, Eric, at an absolute maximum, we can spend X amount, of, we can invest X amount of dollars on the entire project on um, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Okay. Well, where, how do I allocate that? Do I, how much do I allocate towards the engineer, the architect, the build, the materials, the, you know, like, there's so many different aspects to that. Um, And when you're doing multiple projects at a time, it becomes a bit challenging. But my point of bringing that up is like, you can get lost on the items that you're buying to bring, bring an element. And I'll, I'll wrap it up with this too, man. Um, 
I'll see if I can find this. And maybe we could post it up in the, the show notes. Um, but I was looking at properties yesterday in Denver, in Denver, Colorado, and uh, or in Breckenridge. And I was looking at like some really cool properties. And I found this one unit that was, I'm looking at my wish list here. Uh, I found this one unit that was about 45 minutes to 60 minutes south of Breckenridge in a small town called uh, Alma, I believe it is. And it doesn't look like the the area is like an area that you really travel to. I, I'm unfamiliar with it, so I could be wrong with that. But it doesn't, you know, if you're going to Breckenridge area, you want to stay in Breckenridge. This town doesn't seem like it's the main a main destination, right? But when I was looking at this, this I found this one property. It's called Spirit Line Cabin between Alma and Breckenridge. All right. Uh, I'm going to do a quick screen share here. Maybe you could do the screen share as I'm communicating. But this property, man, I was blown away with the design of this unit. And it was in an area, again, 45 minutes, 60 minutes south of Breckenridge. It's a four bedroom, small little cabin. And I was going through the the, the pictures and I was just blown away on the detail that they put into this property, right? So yeah, so that's it there. Beautiful little log cabin. It's got a story to it, you know, like the wood out front. And like, you look on the inside, like the, you have everything from, you have everything from like the, the leather and like, just like they tied in every aspect. They have music in here. They have the fire going. And then look at the next picture, this picture here, uh, curated vinyl records right in the property and there's like an artistic photo of that experience the reason why i'm bringing this up man is i was super close to booking this property just because of the experience of what they put into this property from the books to the the colors just the whole thing is really freaking awesome i had seven properties i was looking at some in the center of breckenridge all the way down to this property i had other properties that had five bedrooms that were massive uh and then this one says four bedrooms but it's a small little cabin right for the people that are listening this was the most expensive property out of all the units i was looking at including the big ones in lux, lux like airbnb lux properties in breckenridge this was an hour away give or take from Breckenridge. Uh, and it's nearly a thousand dollars a night for this property. Wow. Right. That's Which crazy. is crazy. And what, what I recognized, I was like, Oh man, like this is what p you can justify a, you, you can justify these prices by creating world-class experiences. Right. And it's like, this is just a couple that, that are running it, but you could tell that they're designers. You can tell that, they put a lot of effort into every detail of this, but they're justifying a thousand dollars a night for being an hour away from the destination. And this was like the only property in that area and more expensive than any property. I, I shouldn't say any property. There was like three, $4,000 a night properties in Breckenridge that were unbelievable, but comparable. I was blown away and I did end up going with another property because of the price which I mm -hmm. thought was interesting too. I was like, oh, okay, I, I decided to stay in Breckenridge and go with a smaller property versus taking the trip out there. But I thought that was incredible, man, um, that they can justify those prices. And I, I truly believe it's because of the experience. They got five-star reviews out of 102. They're at five stars with 102 reviews. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's crazy, the, the price that they're charging because it's, it's normally priced at 1000 a night, I think. There's a little yep. discount here for the dates that I'm looking at, but, um, but yeah, they, this is, uh, this is an incredible property. And also the photos, the, they did a really good job with the photos. Exactly, too. man. They created an experience. They created the experience like the fourth or the fifth photo in is him playing. Yeah. Like that's, that's like a Instagram photo. You know what I'm saying? Like, that just creates an experience of like being in the woods at a cabin, fire going with old vinyl records, some whiskey, some wine. It's like, oh man, this feels like home. They cult they created that with just one photo. Yeah. Right. And all the elements. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. This by the way, that's something that uh, one of our Legends X students asked me 
uh, a couple of days ago is actually, is it a good idea to have people in your Airbnb photos? And I think it's a good idea, actually. Yeah. It really yeah, helps I mean, you visualize can't... the experience. Yeah, and we're going to do that up in uh, Idlewild. Um, uh, once we launch the Free Wild brand, we have John, our head of media, who is uh, creating an entire, we're going to create an entire experience up there and have multiple different photos of us using the property in a certain way. But there is an element of over overkill in there that you have to like, you can tell that there's only two photos of people mm-hmm. and, and, and I think they did it perfectly. All the photos are beautiful. The design's beautiful. And they're asking a thousand a night for this unit, which is unreal. So, yeah. but yeah, man, I love this topic. I think it's something that we should continue to go into. And, uh, as we get deeper into the design side, uh, you know, bringing on and t- just talking about that experience, I think will be uh, very useful. Yeah. yeah. We'll definitely be sharing more in the next couple of months about the, our uh, adventure here with the, with these renovations. Um, but yeah. I'm, uh, I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it. Just seeing that one unit being, uh, a, you know, one of the top performers in our market already just tells me that, and we haven't done anything to that unit. Right. So tells me that there's a lot of, a lot of potential, um, if we really put our effort into this. So yeah. Yeah, man. Excited too. All right, brother. Well, I'm off to the chiropractor now. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, We'll, uh, we'll be back next week, of course. Uh, and on Monday, we'll we'll have an episode as well. And we're coming up to 500, so we're going to do something special. We'll, uh, That's right. We'll not announce that next week. But thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, have a great weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. See you guys.